It's now time for our speaker. Our speaker today is Bruce Shelton. Now, if any of us ever had any doubt that our ministry here is a service order, you just need to watch Bruce for a few minutes, you got the answer. He serves as many things, one of which is the hip, a senior pastor, music minister, head of building and grounds, which means he gets a call at least once a week that something's broken or that a tree branch fell or something. But mostly, he serves people on a one-to-one -one basis as they require it. Anyone with a personal problem or an interpersonal problem or anything on their mind can always go to Bruce and he will help them. And he's in a good position to do that, having worked for many years as a uh, counselor in the Virginia Beach court system, which is like trial by fire for, for counseling. <clears throat> so, without further ado, let's welcome our own Pastor Bruce Shelton. Thank you, Lloyd. You know, when Lloyd introduces you, you never know what he's going to say. So you were easy on me today, Lloyd. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you this morning. And uh, uh, as is my custom, I'd ask you to help me with this talk. Uh, if we can all just be quiet just for a few moments and let's tune within and feel the Spirit of God, and let's ask God just to use me as his minister this morning to say the words that will be of the most help to you. Thank you, Lord. All right, well, today we're going to take a look at the Bible. Uh, that's a, a book that we don't talk a lot as much here about as we really I would like for us to do. Uh, the Bible is a very interesting book. Uh, according to the Guinness World Book of Records, the Bible has sold over 5 billion copies. Most of them have been sold since the Gutenberg Bible, I mean, printing press was, uh, was invented back in 1440, you know, A.D. So that's a lot of books. Now, do you all know what the second most popular book is in terms of book sales? It, <laughs> I knew somebody was going to say that. Uh, it's again, it's um, the Koran. And the Koran has sold 800 million copies. Now, 800 million is an enormous number. And however, it's a lot less than the 5 billion for the Bible. That's not to say the Koran is not, the, I mean, what, can, what can you say about the Koran? It's, it's a God's gift to us. But my point here is that there's something about the Bible that has, has touched the lives of millions and millions of people over the past, especially the past five or six centuries. And uh, so what, what is it that's the magic about, this, about this, this book that most of us don't read very often? Um, my, one of my favorite Bible teachers is, uh, my favorite Bible teacher is Emmett Fox. He's the one who really kind of made the Bible come alive to me. And for that, I'm very thankful. But he says the Bible is like a vortex of spiritual energy. And I found this to be true. And I've, sometimes I'm upset or something, and I'm trying to calm down. I pull the Bible up, and I read some verses from the Bible. Now, not all the verses in the Bible, I don't, they don't register with me. They don't, that, they don't resonate. So the, you know, I don't believe every word, every uh, verse in the Bible is, uh, you know, is, is, is absolutely the word of God. Uh, the fundamentals to be mad at me for saying that, but I think there are, there are, on the other hand, the Bible is filled with spiritual gold. And if we're looking for spiritual gold, we'll find it. <laughs> and a lot of people pick the Bible up and read something they don't like, and they say, oh, this is, this is, I'll never read this again. Well, if that ever happened to you, I suggest you, you know, give the Bible another chance, because it's got some real power for, for those of us who, who really uh, use, read the Bible in a prayerful state. Now, uh, the book of Psalms in the Bible is particularly a powerful book to me. It's one of my favorites because there's a number of chapters that are what we can call treatments for fear. You know, uh, we talked about fear in the readings today. Uh, fear is our great challenge. We all experience fear. Uh, fear has what I view as three main faces or three main, main ways that we, we experience it, three main faces. Uh, 
They are anxiety, that's excessive worry, uh, uh, anger, it can, it can turn to rage. And the third face of fear is uh, depression or despair. Now, anytime we're feeling one of those emotions, behind those emotions is the root emotion of fear. Fear is what's driving it. So I'm angry at somebody because they said something to me and they, I, they, I felt like they attacked my self-esteem. And so that makes, I'm, I'm fearful, I, something wrong with me. And that, that fear, see, makes me angry or makes me worry or makes me self-critical, you see. So now fear is interesting. We can define fear as simply being the absence of God. Okay? Anytime we're fearful, it means we've lost our contact with, with, our, with our true self. You see, the, our spiritual essence. And we do that all the time. So in, in a way, a fear is like an alarm bell. It's like actually, a, it's actually a protective measure. It's telling us, uh, Bruce, you, you just lost your connection. Reconnect, you know, reboot. Get, get, find, get it, reconnect with your spiritual self, your true self, you see. Uh, all, all the great spiritual teachers teach this, you know, that the kingdom of, as Jesus put it, the kingdom of God is within us. Uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, they talk, talks about the Atman. Uh, in Christianity, we used to talk about, we use the word the Christ. But the, it's the same, these are same, these are words that mean the same exact thing. It means God's presence within us, you see. And either we've got that connection or we don't. When we don't have that connection, we suffer. It's just that simple. So this is why spirituality is so important. And your spiritual practices are your, uh, your way, you see, of reconnecting. What, do you, what are your spiritual practices? Do you spend time in prayer and meditation? Uh, some people find yoga really helpful, qigong, breath work. Um, all of these are spiritual practices that can help us to reconnect with our center, okay? And goodness knows we, we need help with that. And... Uh, so if you're, the, uh, one thing I hope will just be a takeaway from today is that you'll uh, set aside some time every day just to be with God, you see? Just set aside some time, you know? And I've said many times up here with me, it takes about an hour. I, I spend about an hour every day, and it's, it's just it's changed my life, you know? It's what it's enabled me to, to, you know, have the life that I have as I'm, when I'm up. Because we all get rustled by the, <laughs> the challenges of life. Uh, relationship problems, job problems, health problems, uh, financial problems, legal, whatever it may be, we all, the world is constantly throwing curveballs at us, it seems. And uh, it awakens what? Fear within us. And then, okay, I can choose fear or I can choose love. I can choose God. God is divine love. And uh, so that's what prayer and meditation is all about, is choosing God. And if we give some time, you see, put some time aside, that's that's a very powerful statement to the divine as to how sincere we are. If we don't have time for God, how, how do we expect God to have time for us, right? <laughs> and so when we read uh, the Psalms, uh, such as the 23rd Psalm, what the, the, the beauty of it is, is that when we, we're fearful and I've got my, we got this, all of us have got this voice in the head. You all know about the voice in the head, right? The voice in the head just never stops, you know, we, especially when we've got fearful thoughts, the voice wants to analyze and reanalyze and, and it, it get, reinforce it and just, it doesn't want to let go. Uh, the mind's doing this, you see, if it does this for problems in the beginning, it's necessary, but the, the problem with our mind is it doesn't know when to stop. The voice just keeps going on, so somebody that says something upsetting to me 10 years ago, if I, if I don't let it go, I might wake up three in the morning, all of a sudden this thought comes to me, you know, I'll never forgive that person for what they did to me. <laughs> I'll hold on to that, you know, and uh, and so the voice, the head is constantly going like this, and so okay, I, I, Bruce, I, you got to stop this, right? Uh, you let go of that thought, but I try to let it go, and the ego doesn't want to let it go. The ego wants to hold on to it. Isn't that interesting? What's the ego? Uh, I define the spiritual ego. This is not the Freudian definition, but the spiritual ego is our ego is our human mind. That, it, that has lost its way, that has lost its connection with God, okay? Uh, our human mind and our physical bodies are the greatest gifts the universe has given to us. Uh, we take them for granted, but they're incredible gifts. And uh, however, when our human mind loses its connection with its divine source, with its true self, you see, the human mind then takes over and becomes a, 
a, it's a great servant, but it's a terrible master. And so that's a dilemma we all find in is we, the human mind kind of takes over uh, and we lose our connection with God. And then we have all these negative thoughts. So what, how, what are we going to do about this? Well, if we pick up like the 23rd song and we read it in a meditative, prayerful state, what happens is we're, it, by doing that, we're taking our attention off of the problem, you see, and placing our attention upon the presence of God. Okay? And that, that's huge because uh, if I do that, the words in the 23rd song, like many of the words in the Bible, are really from, uh, written by individuals who are inspired. Those words have power. And so, okay, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm upset and I'm thinking, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I let that work on my consciousness, you see. And we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, that, that particular, all these verses in just a minute. But that's the basic, great, that's the reason they work, you see. <laughs> Uh, my, my great te- my favorite teacher, one of my favorite teachers, Emmett Fox, uh, he gave us what we call, the, he calls it the golden key. Some of you know about the golden key. The, he, sem- he says the golden key is when we have problems in life, it can be a relationship problem, whatever it might be. Um, the golden key is when we, it, it, it consists of our doing the best we can to take our attention off the problem and placing our attention instead upon the presence of God, you see. And since God is omnipresent, if we got a problem that's awakening a lot of fear within me, uh, it simply means I've lost my connection with God. So I'm going to place my, read these Psalms and place my attention upon the presence of God. And that has the effect, see, when, you, when, when I finish doing this, it calms me down. It's huge. And, and that's why I think that's one of the reasons five, the Bible has sold five billion copies, is I'm not the only one that's experienced this. Uh, and a lot of you have know what I'm talking about. Uh, other psalms besides the 23rd Psalm that are really pop, really wonderful. Uh, Lord was quoting the 91st Psalm, uh, powerful song, you know. Uh, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High abideth under the shadow of the Almighty. And what's the secret place? The secret place is God's, is that, is that altar within our own consciousness, you see, that we go to. And uh, so, um, uh, so anyway, that psalm, is, that psalm is very healing. And one of my other favorite songs is a 46 song. Uh, that's the psalm that contains those beautiful words. There is a river, the streams whereof make glad uh, the city of God. God is in the midst of her, and uh, she shall not be moved. God shall help her in that right early. And then in that same psalm, there's that, what I view as maybe one of the most powerful statements in the whole Bible. It says, be still and know that I am God. You see, it's in stillness. It's only in stillness that we can connect. That stillness means we quieten down our mind. The mind's no longer running us. <laughs> so um, let's take a look here, talk for a few minutes about the, the book, the Psalm 23 itself. Um, Chris, I mean, God, what a, what a great way. I, I, I feel like I have nothing to talk about after that psalm because that psalm just captures every, the whole thing. And thanks to Judith Davidson for that, <laughs> giving you that an inspiration to write it. But the, tw- the 23rd psalm goes like this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they do comfort me. Uh, thou, preparest a ta- thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, if we just think about, you know, the idea is we, we read these psalms, and it, they have a healing effect upon us, because if we really meditate upon each of these, these verses, they become very powerful. An alternative, you see, to, to turning to, the, to uh, the spiritual practice 
when we get stressed out, what do a lot of people do? They turn to alcohol or drugs, right? Gosh, I, I drink some alcohol and it's like magic. I just feel better, right? But if that's my way of dealing with life, you see, it, it's a, it leads me down a very, very dark path. And I can say that from having worked with thousands of people professionally who have alcohol and drug problems. And that's, that's the reason that people have those problems is because they try to use alcohol or drugs to self-medicate themselves to deal with their ang what? Their anxiety, their depression, and their anger. <laughs> and it, it's, it, it's what, you know, I always tell people if you use, especially, you know, alcohol uh, excessively, uh, it gives short-term gain, long-term pain. So it's a much better way. Uh, spiritual practices are totally different. Spiritual practices are real, you know. The problem with alcohol is I drink, I get high, I numb myself, I pass out. Next day I wake up. The problems are still there and they're even worse than they ever were. <laughs> they caused me to drink in the first place. I still got to go to that job where the guy hollers at me all day and, and so forth. So, uh, okay. So, let's take let's, this very, very, very first verse there. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, and that first verse to me is extremely powerful. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll start reading the 23rd song and I don't get past that first verse because it's, it says so much. The Lord is my shepherd. That means that we're never alone. How often do we feel alone and, and kind of alienated and we just, we just feel alone and, and lonely. And uh, this is telling us that we're never alone. Once we connect with God, we have that, we find that kingdom of heaven within ourselves that we, we're, we're, we constantly have the, our, God is our shepherd guiding and directing us and protecting us. Uh, Jesus used that term uh, himself. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And Jesus is using, is talking about he's the good shepherd for all of humanity. And uh, he loves us so much that he's willing, he has so much unconditional love that he's even willing to give his life for us. Um, and uh, like, a, like a parent might do for their child. And uh, so... <clears throat> When we're going through life, we're constantly, it's like a path, right? And we constantly come to forks in the road and we're having to make decisions. Do I go right? Do I go left? And uh, this, this verse is telling us that we, well, we have, we have a shepherd to guide us if we just ask for help. And uh, uh, I used to walk the Appalachian Trail. I, I love the Appalachian Trail. I, uh, every year I'd go out for usually a week, just spend a week uh, Oh, by myself in the wilderness with, and with God. And it was, I did it for a spiritual practice. It was, it was really wonderful. And uh, I did over 1,300 miles over 38 years. I just go out and do a few miles every, a section they call it, every, every year. And uh, uh, when you're hiking the Appalachian Trail, they have these white blazes telling you, you know, this is the path. But sometimes you'd come to a fork in the road, you see, and there was there was no there was no white blazes, <laughs> and, and so I pull up my map. And if you, you know if you make the wrong, so I, that was my guide. And if I did if I make the wrong, if you were hiking a trail like that with a heavy pack on your back, and you go the wrong trail and you go an hour the wrong way, we'll see say before you get you find realize you're lost. Uh, <laughs> you uh, it's a, you pay a big price. So we the point here is that we all need help and guidance when we're all walking the path of life. And so this, shepherd, this verse is telling us the Lord is our shepherd. You see, the good shepherd looks after his sheep. I shall not want. Now, that's a big one because uh, our ego constantly wants things, you know. Our, our ego is never satisfied. No matter how much we have, we want something else. If only I can find the right person in my life, I'll finally be happy, right? And we get, finally we get, that happens, and then... Uh, we, I want I got to other, I want something else. You know, I thought that was going to make me happy, but now I, it's, that's not. I'm, I got to find something else. And uh, uh, Eckhart Tolle says the theme song of the of the ego is, "I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction." Excuse me, Mike Yeager, for that terrible imitation. <laughs> but but uh, that's a good that's a good way to put it, isn't it? And, uh, and I love the story of Carl Jung, uh, the famous uh, Swiss psychiatrist. He 
came to this country and you know everybody from Europe when they come here they want to go out west and see the Indians the same guy, guy, people they've been watching on movies cowboy movies you know but they want to go to the west so Carl Young goes out west and he visits a reservation he's talking to an Indian chief and he says uh, the uh, <clears throat> what do you think of the white man and the Indian chief was silent for a moment and he looked at him he says you know we look in their eyes and all we see is they want things. They're never, never satisfied. They just want. They, and then he paused, the chief paused for another moment. He says, we think they're crazy. You know? <laughs> Not, <laughs> the chief might have had a point there, you know? Uh, and so uh, Ram Das tells the story. He had these two uncles, and they're both very wealthy. And uh, they both had their own private jets. And... One uncle came to him one day and was all upset. He was kind of almost in despair. He says, you know, Uncle Louie just bought a new jet, and his, it cost him $25 million. And my jet only cost me $15 million. And I'm really, this is, this is terribly upsetting to me. He's got a better jet than I do, right? So no matter how much we, Uncle Louie has and, and this other uncle has, it's never enough. I got, now I've got to have a $25 million jet to be happy, you know? And uh, that's the way our egos are, you see. And uh, this verse here is telling us that when we get, our, get right with God, we have everything. We don't need anything else, you see. Uh, what, do, what, is it, what is our basic needs? What do we really want above everything else? I, you know, well, I want to win the lottery. Well, why do you want to win the lottery? Because what you want is, is with that, with that, that winning the lottery awakens within you. And what's within all of us, you see, uh, which, which is the, what Jesus called the kingdom of God, the Christ within, which the, the, one, the five things that we want, according to my, another great spiritual teacher, Eckhart Tolle, is number one, we want uh, peace of mind, you see. If we have peace of mind, that's, that's everything. Uh, we want uh, joy. And we don't want joy that's where I'm, it's happiness, like I'm happy one day and unhappy the next. We want joy that has no duality to it, you see. And uh, the third thing we want above everything else is love. All human beings need love. We need, we need to receive love, we need to give love. And the fourth need we have is, is intelligence. We need, to, we need to know what we, need, what we want to know when we need to know it, you see. And when we connect with our inner self, we have our highest self, uh, we connect with universal mind, you see. And so we want intelligence. And the fifth thing we want above everything else is a sense of purpose. What's, what's this all about? Who, who exactly am I? What's my purpose of my life? Those are the five core uh, needs that we all have. They're, these are spiritual needs, <laughs> not, not, not ego needs. And so when we win the lottery, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to find joy. It awakens joy temporarily, uh, peace. I don't have to worry about money anymore. All this love in me, I can now I can help people. Uh, but see, I, it, that comes and goes. Money comes and goes. Uh, we don't need to win the lottery to find all that. It's actually all within us, you see. Uh, and so we find this, of course, through our daily prayer and meditation. Uh, Jesus says, uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything will be yours, you see. And so once we get right with God, everything else falls into place. We, we have everything that we need. You know, Jesus didn't surround himself with wealth, <laughs> you know, but he had, he had, what, he, he had the, what, he, what we really need, which is love, joy, peace, and he, look what he did for the world. Uh, the next uh, two verses go like this. He uh, maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, these four, these, these, these four different teachings here, four different clauses, okay? Each of the clauses actually talks, addresses one of the four parts of who we are, okay? If we use a four-part model to, to answer the question, who are you, we can say, well, uh, we're, we're body. We have a mind that has two dimensions, thoughts and feelings, okay? Then we have our spiritual self. Our spiritual self is not a part of who we are. It actually is who we are, you see. We're spiritual beings who have a body and uh, intellect and emotions. And these 
four clauses here, these four teachings in these two verses, uh, help, help us to understand those uh, and meet the needs of those four parts of who we are. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Now, for a sheep and lambs to lie down in green pastures, that's everything. All their physical needs are being met. You see, uh, sun shining, uh, green grass to eat, uh, nice ground to, to lie down on. Um, I, back in 2006, I had a really neat experience of walking from one side of England to the other, called the Coast to Coast Walk, 180 mile walk. And uh, so the English countryside is dotted with all these, these uh, brick walls that were built, uh, go, up, you know, go up about five, four or five feet, just big enough to keep the sheep in. They were built, and once they were built, you know, built hundreds of years ago, and once you have a brick wall like that, it stays forever. But it's dotted with all these little sheep fences, and I'm walking through these, uh, you know, pastures, and, and I can see the sheep, and they're just so happy, just, if I can use the word happy, I don't know if they probably wouldn't use the word happy, but they're so content is a better word, uh, with every, all their physical needs are being met. So this, this uh, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures is telling us that all of our physical needs will be met for food, shelter, uh, clothing, transportation, all, all our physical needs will be met when, when, we write, when we're right with God and have that connection with our good shepherd. Uh, he leadeth me beside the still waters. Now in the Bible, waters represents emotions, okay? So this, this verse, is, I mean, this uh, clause is just telling us that uh, we'll experience emotional peace, peace within. The waters will be placid, will be still, you see? And uh, uh, he restoreth my soul. Well, this is the you know the uh, this is telling us that th with the help of our good shepherd, we will have our soul restored. We will reconnect to our true self. Uh, and this last part is saying uh, he he leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, in the Bible, you know, the word righteousness as Elizabethan English, we don't use that word very much. We, as a matter of fact, it's not a, when we say somebody's self-righteous, that's not a compliment, right? But uh, he leadeth me in the path of righteousness. Righteousness in the Bible means right thoughts, right words, right actions. So God will lead me in a, in a, in a path so that I'll have the right thoughts in my head. Instead of all these negative thoughts, these judgmental thoughts, these angry thoughts, that might go, I can go on and on with that. Uh, the Good Shepherd helps me to have the right thought in my head. When I have the right thought, I, get, I, I experience peace. You see? <laughs> What's the right thought? Any thought that's in accordance with the law of love. You see? So when my, every thought I have in my head is in accordance with the law of love, I, I experience peace. Then this uh, psalm goes on uh, with the fourth verse. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they do comfort me. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's one of the most popular <laughs> uh, verses. I think we all, we all know that. Uh, in this verse, it addresses the, the primordial fear that most human beings have, and that is the fear of death, you see. And it's saying that... Uh, even if we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, even if our lives were in a situation right now where our life is in danger, uh, such as someone, I think of someone in a war situation, uh, I, I, even then, because God is with me, and because I'm, I've connected with my true self, uh, I'll feel no, I will fear, there's that word fear, I will fear no evil. Uh, for thou, because thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Uh, the shepherd uses the rod. The rod is that uh, stick that has a, a pole that has a hook on the end. And the, so my, my good shepherd will guide me back on the path when I'm lost and uh, protect me from, from danger, from falling off the cliff if I'm going up a mountain trail. Uh, the rod is, a, is a, actually a weapon that the shepherd would use to protect uh, the sheep. So we got, we're protected, we have a, um, the, the, by the rod and the staff. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, thou anointest my head with oil. Uh, one, this is just reaffirming what the earlier verse said, 
Uh, even in the presence of my enemies, I will fear no evil. Uh, we don't have a, eat, a, eat a table and celebrate life, you see, <laughs> if we're fearful. And so this is just reinforcing the idea that we, in God's presence, uh, we are, our fear is eliminated. We're, we're, you know, we're totally at peace. Thou anointest my head with oil. Now, two weeks ago, we had uh, eight of our folks here got, were, had their heads anointed with oil. Uh, you all, some of you might remember that ceremony. Very powerful. And uh, when <clears throat> to be anointed with oil is the highest thing that can happen to any of us because what this is teaching us is that uh, when, we're, when, when God anoints us with oil, we are being blessed by God, you see. And the greatest thing that can happen to us is to be blessed by God. Now, we don't have to, you know, be a, a anointed in a, uh, in a ceremony like this. Anytime any, any of us turn to God and we get ourselves right with God, we're being blessed by God. So that's why the, the, the eight Beatitudes all start with the word blessed. Uh, you know, to be blessed by God is the greatest thing that can happen to us. So once we have got, our, got that, we're, we're aware of our good shepherd, we're blessed by God. Uh, my cup runneth over. Uh, and the last verse is, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So with this verse, which I thought Chris sang so beautifully just now, uh, it, uh, uh, it, it's an affirmation. It's like an explanation point. It's like a reminder that uh, uh, with God's presence, uh, thy, uh, thy goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord in the presence of God. Uh, in other words, I'll be fully aware as to who I am. You see, I'll be fully awakened, and it won't be a temporary thing. It'll be a permanent thing all the days of my life so that's just one interpretation you see of this of this 23rd psalm uh, it has a very deep meaning and we can say that about so many other other books in the bible uh, one thing i if nothing else happens in this talk today i just hope this talk will motivate some of you maybe to pull out some of those psalms and read them next time you're especially next time when you're being challenged in life you know and uh uh, it, you'll find it's like it's like a it's like a cure. Um, I remember when I was uh, uh, going to Talbert Park Baptist Church as a as a young young guy. I was a, I was in their choir be between the ages of eight and about eighteen, and uh, so they, the Baptists are really great. They have three services Sunday services right eight o'clock service. Then at nine thirty to ten thirty, I'd go to Sunday school, study the Bible, and then eleven o'clock was the uh, main service and then seven o'clock was a Sunday after Sunday evening service you know and uh, it was it was perfect you see I really love that and being in the choir I went to a bunch of these different services so one night I'm at the evening service and this uh, man gets up in the evening service they let lay people talk uh, who are not the ministers there and this fella got up and he says you know when I come home uh, from work this this is back in the 1950s. I come home from work. I'm stressed out. I'm worried about this. He says, uh, instead of grabbing a box of uh, a bottle of aspirin, I just pull out my Bible and I read it. And he says that I, I let it work on me, and it just calms me right down. You see, there's that vortex of spiritual energy that uh, Emmett Fox talked about. So this is my talk, and thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.